Welcome to Cultivating the Heart of Compassion. This lecture on enlightenment and the spiritual journey today features Ram Das, a leading speaker on the integration of Western culture with Eastern philosophies. Ram Das began his studies in consciousness research in the 1960s, working with such early visionaries as Algis Huxley, Alan Watts, and Timothy Leary he grew interested in the very nature of the human spirit. His curiosity led him to a period of intense study in India. Since then, he has worked to synthesize Western thought with the spiritual traditions of the East. Ramdas received his PhD from Stanford University and has taught at leading universities across the country, including the University of California and Harvard. He is the author of the landmark book, Be Here Now, and more recently, How Can I Help? Cultivating the Heart of Compassion was originally presented by Ram Das as part of a 60-city tour on behalf of the Seva Foundation. This particular recording was made before an enthusiastic audience of over 2,000 people in Denver, Colorado during the spring of 1987. And now, Sounds True presents Cultivating the Heart of Compassion with Ram Das. When I look at the um, gathering as standing out in the lobby as welcoming, welcoming people, I meet so many ancient beings that um, it always seems amusing that I should get up and tell you anything. I mean, I think if I assumed I knew anything you didn't and I had to figure out what it was, I'd freak. But I don't really assume that. I, I really assume we come together for a sort of heart-to-heart -heart resuscitation to sort of reassure ourselves that what we know is true is true. Because out in the world, sometimes you lose it a little. Because you surround with people that keep saying it's not true. And so I'm here to reassure you that it is. <laughs> now, what exactly is true is interesting. Therein lies a tale. And the predicament about telling you what's true is that it's unspeakable. Every night I have to face the statement that he who knows does not speak and he who speaks does not know. And just before I come out here, I think of that. See, that, <laughs> that keeps me straight, you see. So I, I recognize that, that it's certainly not the words that are going to do it. It's really the space between the words, and I can imagine that there will be a time later down the path when we will come together and we will sit here for three hours in silence and get up and walk out and say, profound evening. <laughs> <laughs> we're not quite ready yet, but we're on the way. I asked somebody last evening, how, has, um, how have you changed as a result of all this spiritual stuff you've done all these years? And he said, that's a very interesting question. And I re reflected about how I would answer that. Have I changed? About a year ago, I met a colleague of mine from Harvard from the old days. And you understand that um, for 25 years now, I have been huffing and puffing and trying to get enlightened as hard as I could. I have fasted and prayed, mantrad, pilgrimaged, sat before my guru, 
done all night this isn't that meditated with real meditators <laughs> I mean I really put my time in so to speak and um, two things have been surprising to me one is a year ago I met one of my old Harvard colleagues and after a few minutes he said you know Dick you haven't changed a bit <laughs> And the other interesting one is that that I keep trying to become divine and the more I try, the more letters I get saying, thank you for being so human. <laughs> now, at first those letters were, they put me off a little bit. I don't want to be human. But, um, Something has changed over these years, and maybe those letters are a compliment, and I can really understand them in a, a nothing special kind of way. Many of us have been through so many stages of this journey at this point. We're all still relative beginners, but that's just an astral line. You don't have to believe that. I mean, see all these lines like we're at the beginning or there's a path or we're near the end. These are all astral storylines. How do we know where we are? We might be one breath away from enlightenment or death or who knows. The uncertainty is great. It just keeps it wide open. When I... Um, like you was born, I donned a space suit for living on this plane. And uh, it was this body. This is my space suit. And it had a steering mechanism, my prefrontal lobes, and all the brain motors coordinating stuff. And just like those. Rusty Schweiger and the others that go to the moon and they wear their uniforms and they learn how to grab things and lift things. So I did that. You know, I learned my prehensile capacities. And I got rewarded. I get, you get little stars and kisses and all kinds of things when you learn how to use your spacesuit. And you get really good at it. You get so good at using your spacesuit that you can't differentiate yourself from your spacesuit anymore. You think you're your spacesuit. And everybody comes up and says, What a nice suit. See? And you're constantly looking into other people's eyes to find out if you're really wearing a nice spacesuit. It's what I call somebody training. That when you're born, you go into somebody training because your parents know who they are and they're going to make you somebody too. My parents were very intent on making me somebody. They wanted me to achieve, uh, be responsible, be healthy, um, be successful, bring pride to them, and if it didn't interfere with any of those, I should be happy. <laughs> the problem that I experienced, though, was that the suit that I was wearing, it was like you're in a, one of these suits that doesn't quite fit and you're a little uncomfortable and you're constantly trying to readjust yourself. The suit didn't fit, but everybody kept saying, beautiful suit, really impressive suit. You must be very happy. But I wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
They're just putting on this suit. Now, if everybody you look into their eyes and they tell you you're happy and you're not because the suit feels so weird, what do you conclude? It's like those experiments in psychology where they have a group in a room and they have, it's all done, all the group are plants except for one person and they show two lines in which one is shorter than the other and everybody in the room says that the shorter one is longer. And then they ask this other person, this poor sucker who's the subject, is that sh longer or shorter? And about 90% of the time, the person gives in to the rest of the group even though it's obvious that the line is shorter than the other one. Because if you don't, you're so deviant. And who wants to be deviant? My God, life's hard enough. Coping. <laughs> so, I felt when everybody said what a nice suit I was wearing that I must be sick. So I went to an analyst. Now he was wearing another kind of weird suit. See? <laughs> and what he did was he said that for a pittance he would teach me how to wear his suit instead of my suit. You see? <laughs> So, so I learned how to wear his suit, which had even more status connect. I mean, more people said beautiful suit. Part of learning how to wear that suit was you didn't see people anymore. You just saw psychosexual stages of development. You saw <laughs> anal retentives and early phallics and things like that. And I really wasn't very happy in that suit either. In that suit I was a therapist and I really needed to be a therapist because I was so identified with my needs at that point that everybody else had to be a potential patient. So, and if you wouldn't be my patient, I didn't have much use for you because um, I needed to be a therapist full time. So that suit felt weird as well. Well then, um, through the um, kindness of a rather wild Irish fellow, I, um, I, a I took off my suits entirely <laughs> and I stood naked. Um, an elf, let's put it, <laughs> a little Irish gnome. I took off my suit and I stood naked and it felt wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I felt at home, I felt at peace, I felt content. I felt like this is where I had always, I knew in my inner being this is where I really was but somehow I'd never been able to get there. Ever since I had been born into somebodyness, the somebodyness had always short shrifted who I was. As my friend pointed out, you have to go out of your mind to use your head. <laughs> and that what I had been trained in was an ego structure, a conceptual structure that defined who I was and who everybody else was. And most people learn these structures and they're like huge mind nets that come out of your head. And you walk down the street and you're somebody, you say, you know who you are, you dress like somebody, your face looks like somebody, everything is somebody, nuts. This is who I am, 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 this is who you are, this is who you are. And you, everybody is reinforcing their structure of the universe over and over again. And they meet like two huge things meeting, this is who I am, this is who you are. And they, we enter in these conspiracies, I'll make believe you are who you think you are if you make believe I am who I think I am. And we just kind of bump against each other like a huge schmooze of some big mental mind nets that keep walking down the street. And you can see them in everybody. I mean, everybody's busy being somebody. Uh, 
Well, so when I got out of my somebodyness, which was very cramped, I mean, it was like a prison to me. I didn't want to go back to prison. It's like you go out and you see the stars and you smell the air, and then they say, okay, chemicals wearing off, back into prison. And you don't want to go. You say, no, no. But you go anyway. And you go back into your suit. And you feel weird again. You feel doubly weird now because you know that that isn't who you are, but you're caught in it. So that starts quite a journey. It did for me anyway. Because it, re it started a journey in which my object was to get high, was to get out of my suit. It was to get out of my physical, psychological identities, which felt extremely limited. Limited. And I would get incredibly free and high and clear and in love. I'd go, like I'd go to India and I'd sit in the temple or in meditation and I would get so high. I mean, light was pouring out of my head and, and I was some combination of the pure mind of the Buddha and the heart of the Christ, which for a Jewish boy is not bad, you know, and I was... <laughs> really like <laughs> I was really I'd be out there you know and I come back to the States and I go to visit the family and my father would say a simple thing like you got a job <laughs> see and I'd crash see? and I'd say can't go home brings me down yeah. and I began to have a whole list of things that brought me down I mean, cities brought me down, money brought me down, politics brought me down. And I found myself, interestingly enough, wearing a new kind of a suit. It was like, I'm very high. Don't get near me. I'm very high. Okay. Okay. And something felt wrong about it. I mean, I loved being out there in La La Land. I mean, it was, ooh, wow, phew, oh. Hmm. I mean, you go out, or in, or up, or down, and there's no space, that's all phony, but you go wherever you go, that's another plane of consciousness, which is right here, actually, and, and uh, you, you look around, and everybody's um, mishpacha, everybody's the family, everybody's, um, that's Sanskrit, that's all right, that's... Um, <laughs> everybody's sisters or brothers or if you go out far enough you look and there's only one of us in drag I mean appearing to be many there's only and you really see it you experience the oneness of things and it's so connected and so beautiful so that when you come back down into your separateness the pain is incredible because you once again feel that feeling of being cut off. See, as long as you're in your thinking mind, which is the instrument, along our way of evolution, we've developed certain powers or siddhis. One of them is this prehensile thing. Then when we got beyond that, we got to these prefrontal lobes. And those give us the choice. We can remember, plan, analyze, cognate. We can an be analytic linear, etc. And the, that's the major instrument for the spacesuit control mechanism. That allows you to survive on Earth. The problem with the intellect, however, is that it doesn't allow you to escape from dualism. That is, it always thinks about something. So it always takes an object. So as long as you identify with your thinking mind, you are always one thought away from where the action is. You're always thinking about it or looking at it. Eh. You're always in that one thought away from life and you experience that you are cut off by being in your mind. 
And there is a quality that is starving in an individual that is locked in their mind. So when you move to another plane of consciousness, which is no longer, no longer controlled by your intellect, which is really a subsystem, and you move into the metasystem, what you feel at that moment is subjectively in the universe you feel like you are the universe or you feel merged with it or you feel fully in the moment thick with the moment and that richness is so fulfilling it's interesting it just is you can be it the minute you try to know it or experience it, you go back into dualism again. But you can be the thickness of the moment. Now, because I had been so... felt so trapped by my body and my personality and was so unhappy in all of that, my job, it seemed, was to push away those things. And I tried a number of techniques like renunciation. I figured if I just renounced all of it enough, it would go away. All I did was end up a horny celibate. <laughs> it's like giving up smoking, like I haven't smoked in four years, two months, three days, and 22 minutes. A person will die from non-smoking. didn't work because if you push something away it still got you you're busy not doing it not doing it now when I had been as I look back on the stages now and I see for example I used to be identified with my body I mean, that's who I was. I was this body, which I didn't really care for that much. And I, during that time, I was busy not going bald, for example. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, some people are busy not going bald. That's who they are, you know. Like, I had a long piece of hair, and I wore it like this. And, you know, in the, in the wind, you stand like Rodin's the thinker, you know, like this. And you notice how much hair everybody's got. I mean, it's, it's a whole reality. It's a whole world of, like... Yeah. I mean, I'm... Uh, this is a, like a 55-year-old decaying foot right here. And it's just like if you went out in the woods and you saw an old tree trunk. I mean, if I thought that was my foot, I'd freak, but it's... <laughs> It's just a nice decaying foot. It's rather attractive. I mean, this, look at all these veins and these bones, this loose skin. It's kind of, it's getting nice. You know, uh, I have these spots on my head now, and um, there's this porcelana ad that says, um, <laughs> they call these aging spots, I call them ugly. That was the ad. So. <laughs> For me, it's, they call these ugly. I call them aging spots. <laughs> because you, can, you begin to appreciate nature even when it's your own body. When you're not so busy taking it so seriously, when you're not so lost in it. It's just decaying, just like it's supposed to. You know, one of these days it'll drop away. No big deal. But then the personality, that was much more seductive. I mean, I really took that seriously for years. Am I happy? Do I have enough space? Are my relationships fulfilling? I mean, I really need to be nurtured. Because I was a motivational psychologist, so that was all real. I taught that it was real. It must have been real. I was saying it at Harvard. It must have been real. It was a complete melodramatic hype, it turned out. I didn't know that. No, you can have it seriously if you want. There's no rush. There's no time, so we'll wait. 
So you say, what do you mean my personality isn't real? It is real. It's relatively real, and you should... I've had, you know, I, I've had neuroses. I've had an awful lot of neuroses. I mean, I've had sexual neuroses and emotional, psycholo all kinds of motivational neuroses. And I've been through analysis. I took drugs for years. Um, I've been to my guru. I've done spiritual practices. I haven't lost one neurosis in all that time. <laughs> Not one. The only thing that's changed is that they used to be these big neuroses and now they're these like little schmooze. See that, hi, come on in, have tea. They're like old friendly neuroses, like, will they like me? That's a good one. Say, hi, come on in, you know. I can line them up. They're like the children, you know, for a photo family photograph. All my little neuroses sitting here, they're all right here. Okay. I've become really quite fond of them, actually, and, uh, and I look at all the spiritual teachers and all the great saints, and they're all terribly neurotic. I mean, it's just like I'm not going to grow hair if I get really free, probably. <laughs> so I think my neuroses are just my style now, see, they're just, they're, they, they give me style. Well. That's what flips. The dramas are still there, the desires and the needs. You just don't take them so seriously. You don't, I need this. It's like, I'm depressed. You're really depressed? Yeah, I'm depressed. You're completely depressed? Yes, I'm completely depressed. Every bit of you, oh boy, am I depressed. It's not, oh. Any part of you not depressed? No. <laughs> completely depressed. Are you noticing your depression? Yes. Tell me, is the noticer depressed? Well, the notice is just noticing. Aha. See? see, and after a while, you, yeah, yeah. After a while, you get so that the, you climb into the noticer more frequently because you know the depression is just a thing that comes and goes. Or try boredom, for example. That's a great one. Everybody buys into that. I'm bored. What am I going to do? Call somebody, turn on the television, read a book, do something. My God, I'm bored. You don't have to be bored. There's so much to do. Things to think about. Read the, listen to the news. See, those are all melodramas and you milk them. We trip out on ourselves so much. There's nothing wrong with being bored. I'm bored. Nothing's ever going to happen again. See, nothing is. That's what's so funny. <laughs> People say to me, this is a really heavy tour you're doing. You're traveling, you're doing 60 cities. Must be exhausting. It's funny. I didn't notice I was doing anything. I'm just sitting here. The plane does the flying. I don't, you know. It, I just come. I, do, I, I look at somebody that's raising three kids. And I think, oh my God. You know? See, after you end tripping, and that's the thing, it dies hard, I'll tell you, because you want to milk it just once more. <laughs> I mean, you can get just a little more juice out of it, just a little more. Yeah. Because we've all been grown up so much with the myths of this culture that more is better. And that just another one will be just a little bit more. I mean, ice cream is good, but in those great big cones that are made of that special, like waffles, oh, God. And have you tried that ice cream shop that's over? You've got to go 40 miles, but it's worth it. <laughs> uh, we're living in the yuppie paradise of more is better. And we keep dramatizing it. I need this to be happy.
Then there comes a time when all the trips start to seem empty to you. I mean, you're going to buy a new car and you get it and you, you get into it and you really want to milk the feeling of a new car. You walk down, the, you drive down the street and you're looking to see if anybody's looking and you feel that power. Wow, boy, the transmission's beautiful and boy, oh boy, and you just, wow. And then a few minutes later, the first squeak <laughs> or the next payment. until finally, even as you're about to reach for it, it's already empty. Yeah, yeah. You'll go through it, don't worry, don't complain. <laughs> You've just begun. And it gets scary because you based your life on collecting things. I've collected stuff. I kept collecting things. In fact, I had boxes of things. You have attics, but I'm, not, I'm a wandering monk, see? So I have to keep it in boxes. So I'm a sadhu. And my guru was known at one stage as Crack Pot Baba. He was, he was naked, and all he would pick up pieces of Crack Pot and put them on his head. And then when he needed water, he'd use it for water and throw it away. And I'm in, I'm in that lineage, so... As soon as I get rid of my master charge and my Volvo and things like that, I'll be right behind him. <laughs> <clears throat> but my problem is that I have not only the master charge and the Volvo, but I had all these boxes of memorabilia that I couldn't bear to be parted from. I mean, old letters from the 60s and love letters and pictures of people you're never going to see again. And I'd keep putting them in boxes, which I never opened because life was so rich. See? But I'd label them. And then every time I'd move, I would be this wandering sadhu, but behind me would be a UPS truck with all my, <laughs> with my personal history, you know. And then I got to the point where I thought, gee, I haven't opened these in about 10 years. I just keep adding to them. Why am I carrying them? I guess I assume I'm going to run out of the here and now. And later, when it's all horrible, I'll be able to open them and say, remember that time at the Grand Canyon? Wow, look at that. Who was that? You remember that high school? But all it seemed was that life was getting richer and richer not through trippiness, but just through simplicity. So I decided to throw them all away. So I put them out in the dump. But during the night I was out in the dump. Because <laughs> I thought, oh my, I thought of something I was never going to see again and I couldn't bear it, so I was going... <laughs> so I thought I'd better burn them. So I had a big fire and I burned out of 15 boxes, I burned about nine of them. The other six I wasn't ready for yet. Now I have maybe nine. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. So, at any rate, I kept trying to get high all the time to get rid of all this trippiness because it all seemed so finite. And um, I felt something was wrong about the direction I was going because everybody else was sort of doing the same thing in the 60s, early 70s. Alan Watts, I remember, tried to um, remind me. He was a good friend and one night we had been... Um, tasting the altar wine at a Benedictine monastery and it was around two in the morning in his room and he said, Dick, your problem is you're too attached to emptiness. <laughs> and it was true because form seemed so entrapping to me that I really wanted to be empty.
I kept hearing the messages in the spiritual teachings, there's nowhere to stand. But I kept refuting it in my mind because I still wanted to stand out there looking back down. It was so safe. It was so free of any emotional pain. And a lot of people get high in order to get out of emotional pain. I mean, you look up there and you're standing up there and you're looking out and you're seeing how it's all perfect and beautiful and somebody falls down and you say, karma. <laughs> See, there's no heart in it. Um, who, uh, his name is Emmanuel, he's a spook. And um, he's a disembodied being. Everyone has them these days. They're no big deal. Um, they're a dime a dozen, actually. And um, the thing about disembodied beings is they're just like embodied beings. Some of them are smart and some of them aren't. You can't just figure because somebody doesn't have a body they know anything because that's off the wall, you know. I mean, you know just because, you know. Somebody who was like really caught in good and evil on this plane and then they die and then they figure they'll send back a message. So they send back a message like, buy canned tuna and move to Oregon or something like that. Everybody goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, right? <laughs> but just because a person, I mean, I have friends who are supposedly very liberal and they'll say, I'd like any of your friends that you would introduce me to and they'll take any of my weird friends. How do you do? Nice to meet you. But when I tell them I have a friend that doesn't have a body, even my most liberal friends, amazing what prejudice lurks. Some of them say, well, I don't know about that. You know, it's very far out as if, I mean, can you imagine being prejudiced about somebody just because they don't have a body? You know? <laughs> so you can't give up your intuitive... The reason I like Emmanuel is because he agrees with me. <laughs> I mean, he says it just the way I understand it to be. So I said to Emmanuel, I talked to him through this woman Pat wrote against. I don't talk directly to him. He's not, he's not my spook. He's Pat's spook. I said to Emmanuel, um, what am I doing here? Who made this error? <laughs> I mean, how did I end up on earth? I mean, why, why aren't I divine? I know I'm divine. And he said, Ram Dass, you're in school. Why don't you try taking the curriculum? <laughs> he said, why don't you try being human? See, I'd never thought of that. See, I thought that was the error. I mean, this is profound, by the way. Sounds simple. Because I... It slowly has been dawning on me over the past eight, ten years that the game wasn't to be high, the game was to be free. And the free meant you couldn't push anything away and you couldn't grab at anything there was nowhere to stand and there was nowhere not to stand and that I was whatever this incarnation whatever level of reality this was I had to inhabit it impeccably to be free within it and that freedom was going to come through my incarnation not in spite of it and that I was going to have to learn to be, as Christ said, in the world, but not of the world. And that all the things I'd pushed away, I was going to have to, I was going to have to take the curriculum sooner or later. That turned around the direction of my life a lot. Because until that time, when I was busy just trying to get high to get enlightened and I thought enlightened was high that was a confusion in my mind during that time I really begrudged the price of living on the earth I begrudged and I constantly saw 
that I wanted to push away all the, st the experiences of life. It's interesting, when you want to get high, suffering is a real drag, and you want to avoid suffering as hard as you can. When you want to be free, you begin to hear the teachings of the Buddha about the cause of suffering being the clinging of the mind. And when something creates suffering in you, you don't go asking for it unless you're really advanced, I guess, but when, you, when the suffering comes down the pike, you don't turn away from it because you know that the only reason you're suffering is it's telling you something about the clinging of your own mind. And it's being offered to you as a gift. This is, gets very weird because it turns the whole game around. As Rumi says, at first, before you're awakened, you go towards water and you avoid fire. After you begin to awaken, you go towards fire and that brings you into the cooling quality of the water. That instead of going for pleasure, you go for freedom. And it's a very different style of life. And a lot of things that you would have avoided because they brought you down, because you see that the only thing that brings you down is your own mind. It's not the city. The city is just sitting itself. It's being essence city. What are you getting so upset about? It's your reaction to the city that's what's doing it to you. And so, like the other night I was in um, Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, I came into the hall in the evening and there were people waiting around front to, and they said, there's Ram Dass. And See, I, I, I'm like a rent to Ram Dass. I have no idea who I am and I don't even care. I mean, I'm just, a, I'm just an awareness and I'll, I do what I gotta do. So since I don't know who I am, as people project into me, I become what their projection is a lot of the time. Somebody says, Ram Dass. And I go, yes. You know, it's like... <laughs> if somebody says, hi, Dick, I say, hi. I, I don't care. Right. See, if you're somebody and they go, hi, Dick, you say, yes. You see, and it doesn't work. Right. Right. So I came to the hall and everybody was Ram Dass and I was, yes, yes. And I was smiling and I was being Ram Dass. You know, that's the... It's a nice role. It's a, I'm not anybody. What the difference does it make to me? I mean, I'm not, not all those things. It's not like I'm phony. See? It's not like I'm being somebody else back in there. It's not that. It's, it's just, it's a form. We're all in forms. We can't meet except through forms. We don't have to get lost in them. Who will we be this time? Well, I'll be serious. Okay, I'll be light. So I came in the hall. And I was being sweet and loving, and every evening I always ask for a mini boom microphone. That's one of these things. Because when you're sitting cross legged, if you have a straight mic, you've got to spend the whole evening leaning forward like that. So I asked for this, and I walked into the hall, and there was a straight microphone. And I was all smiling, and I suddenly said, What's that? <laughs> and the woman, who was the manager of the hall, said, Well, that's the only microphone we had. And I said, Well, we advised you we needed this. And I started to get into this curmudgeon -y, ooh, yick, and, and I broke up completely. I mean, I just saw... Mercedes and a license plate blocking somebody. Okay. If you have a Mercedes... <laughs> you can make an offering right here. <laughs> If you have a Mercedes GM 9067, it is blocking somebody. GM 9067. Um, and I saw myself get completely um, ugly and I broke up because what I saw was that my guru had come in drag as a microphone <laughs> to say, oh, you think you're so high and mighty, you know. Try this one on for size. It's interesting that as long as you identify with your personality, the things that get you uptight 
are your enemies, the minute you identify with your awareness, then the things that get you uptight show you where your awareness has still sticky fingers. It's like I have, um, I have a difficult time with Casper Weinberger. I mean, he's, he's, I'm sure he's doing what he can. Um, it's just that he's wrong about most everything. And he's not evil. I mean, he's not a dark empire. He's just, a, um, he's frightened. And um, he's a frightened teenager. So um, I have this puja table back in Boston. And on it, I have various holy pictures. I have Buddha and Christ and Ram and Maharaji, Ananda Mai Ma, Mary, Casper Weinberg. In the morning, I light my candles and my incense. Good morning, Buddha. Good morning, Christ. Good morning, Maharaji. Nanda Mai Ma. Good morning, Mary. Hello, Casper. <laughs> that gives me the clue of how far I have yet to go. See? <clears throat> because I'm not going to be able to free Casper till I can be with Casper without closing my heart to him. Even if I say no to him and say, I think you're a jerk and I think you should change your way. The question is, will I do it with my heart open or not? If you can hear that quality of responsiveness rather than reactiveness, and you understand why you're cultivating that quality of equilibrium, of spacious presence about things behind the forms. One more little brief thing and then we're going to meditate together. Um, as the mind quiets down, and there are a lot of practices to help you quiet the mind and to extricate yourself from identification with your thoughts. And the, you are, have more available to you that intuitive heart, that not the emotional quality, but the, it has a quality of presence and softness and the feeling of the depth of love. It's like the quality of Christ's love, that quality. It's a very interesting thing what starts to happen in your life and how you deal with it. It's, a, it's almost... Um, see, most of us grew up feeling like the ego is in a way got built on the idea that if we do the right things, we're lovable. I mean, we just were, grew up in an environment of conditional love. No matter how hard our, how much our parents loved us, they still had an agenda. They had to socialize us. And they would tighten up if you, you know, shit on the living room floor. It's, it's like they just tightened up a little bit, you know. And, and um, you learned how what you didn't do to make it work. And you, do, you ended up with these feelings inside that, and you end up looking to find somebody who will feel safe for you to open your heart around. And most of the time, your heart is armored, as I said. And then somebody comes along, and there's some concatenation of uh, stimuli, uh, some configuration, and it releases that place in you, and you experience the quality of being back in your intuitive heart again. And you say, I am in love. And then, because you've been so starved for that, and that the other person had the key which opened your door to that place, you say, I am in love with you. The other way of saying it is the other person is a stimulus which is a releasing, which releases the releasing mechanism which allows you to be in the place of love. And you are in love. 
And then, because you're so addicted to the state, you want to connect, you want to possess your connection, like any addict. So where will you be Tuesday night, and Friday night, and for the rest of our lives? And you get jealous if the connection services anybody else? Because you really want to feel that quality of being in love. Now imagine if through this, these practices something starts to change so that the veil of your mind is thinner and you actually are experiencing that quality of love more. Now you walk down the street and you look at somebody and you experience that you are in love with them. The old model you have of deprivation says, I better collect this person. Okay. Because you're used to not having love. You've been so starved. So you say, let's nest. And you get feathers and twigs and drapes and you, you create a nest and you get all cuddly. Do you love me? How much do you love me? Oh, I love your eggs. Oh, ooh, everything. Oh, I love. Oh, ooh, wonderful. And then you go to the store for some tofu and beer <laughs> and you're at the checkout counter and you look into the eyes of the person at the checkout counter and it happens again because it's in you but you still have the deprivation model but you got one in the nest okay. so what do you do? some of you have faced that menage a trois very complicated okay. it's the beginning of tremendous economic, political, psychological, social problems and then what are you going to do? Never look at anybody else? Maybe what you're going to have to do, and what I found myself having to do, was give up my deprivation model. Give up the model that I was starved for love. And that I needed to collect my lovers. And what has happened, and I can hardly understand it yet because it's still too new to me, is that everywhere I look I'm beginning to see the beloved and I love people so much I don't know what to do about it and I, I have to realize there's nothing to do about it which is very bizarre to look at somebody and love them that much and not do anything I mean you would want to wave or collect a phone number or <laughs> just hi or something like that but you you know you walk into the bank to cash a check you look at the teller and the teller is just the perfection of God as teller. I mean, it's, it's absolutely essence and you just, ah, but the minute you say, oh, Divine Mother or you're beautiful, she presses the button. I mean, it's like, <laughs> you learn there's nothing to do about it. as you stand back a little bit you see the beauty of the manifestation each one uniquely even the stinkers are essence stinker and your personality is saying no and cut it out and you can't do this and I won't allow this and at the other part you're totally in love with them and then you begin to see the beloved, the guru, whatever you want to call that, everywhere you look. You just see it all the time. There's a Kabir, since the day when I met with my Lord, there has been no end to the sport of our love. I see with eyes open and smile and behold his beauty everywhere. I utter his name and whatever I see, it reminds me of him. Whatever I do, it becomes his worship. Wherever I go, I move round him. All I achieve is his service. When I lie down, I lie prostrate at his feet. Whether I rise or sit down, I can never forget him. For the rhythm of his music beats in my ears.
quiet mind, open heart. Not standing anywhere. If you're burning out of the human heart, go up. But if you go up and you lose your humanity, you lost part of it. Sure, your heart's breaking. That's okay. You bear the unbearable. That's what it means to be free. It means free to embrace it all, free to push nothing away. But it's all empty. It's all play or dance or forms within forms. Sufferings, life, death, all of it. The hardest thing I have to do in these lectures is to integrate the incredible depth of the pain of suffering with the nature of the cosmic giggle. Most people can't handle getting those two things together. I talked about it in Hawaii a few weeks ago, and an article came out in the paper, the headline which I loved, it said, Ex-drug guru says life a cosmic giggle. <laughs> well, that's what happens to them. Oh, it's too beautiful, all of it, all of it, all of it, all of it. And when you're not busy being attached, you then fulfill, you listen and you hear your unique way of manifesting in the earth. You hear your uniqueness. I have an 89-year-old father. My job is to help take care of him and make sure he's happy and taken care of and safe and protected. That's my unique karma. I'm an American. I have something to do about that. I have to make sure that this representative democracy gets a fair shake and gets kept in control. I'm part of an ecosystem. I have to make a statement about nuclear proliferation and, and... But if I do it out of fear and urgency, all I'm doing is increasing the fear which is the root cause of the bomb in the first place. When I take care of Dad, when I protest against the bomb, when I do all the things that I do every day, meet the airplane stewardess, do all the stuff I do every day, all of it is the stuff I use to work on myself in order to increase the equanimity and to increase the compassion. It all is exercise. Your entire life is curriculum. Everything you've got right on your plate is where the stuff for your enlightenment is. It's breathtaking when you stand back and see the beauty of that design. And that includes all of it, all of it, death and sickness and dying and AIDS and all of it.
hearing sounds around you. You might be noticing the beauty of the music. All that's fine, but just keep coming back into the note itself. Keep merging with the note itself. Keep coming in and in and in. And after about three or four minutes, um, I'll lead you through a short uh, visualization meditation, and then we'll take an intermission. Hammy? breathing naturally, just being with what is. Now using your imagination, imagine that right in the middle of your chest, 
there sits a tiny being the size of a thumb. The qualities of this tiny being are that it is radiant, that it is intensely present, that it is boundlessly compassionate, that it is wisdom itself. This tiny being sitting in the middle of your chest Now this tiny being begins to grow in size until its head fills your head, its arms, your arms, its legs, your legs, its torso, your torso. You are a skin around this being of equanimity, of presence, of clarity of caring, of peace. Now you and this being as one begin to grow in size larger and larger until you, your head breaks out of the top of this auditorium. You keep growing in size much larger and larger until your head is sitting among the planets, your body is sitting in space, and the entire earth is within your belly. It is part of your body. Feel your vastness, your silence, your presence, your equanimity. Now this, as you look down within, inside yourself, at the earth, at the mother, at Gaia, at this beautiful, precious earth, which nurtures and feeds at the consciousness that is earth. And towards it you feel such tender compassion. And then you become aware of the myriad beings on the surface of the earth, on its land and waters, in the atmosphere above the earth and beneath the earth. Beneath the water. All these beings, each with its own agenda, each trying to survive, and you see at once the fear and the hope and the tenderness and the cruelty and the chaos and the order and the beginnings and the endings. And from your vantage point of vast equanimity, you understand it all because it's all part of yourself. And towards it all, you feel compassion. And then you continue to grow in size until everything is within you. The galaxies are all part of you. Everything you can think about, past, present, and future, is part of your body. You are the Ancient One.
equanimous? Wise because all form is within you. You are love and truth, ultimate beauty, peace. You have no boundaries. You are both form and unformed. Swami Ram Tirth, the beautiful Indian saint, describes this space. He said, I am without form, without limit. I am beyond space beyond time.